So God said, you go to the tent, and at each tent, I will tell you how many people there are in that tent. I mean, just the, the, <laughs> the devotion that God shows to the individual, it's very encouraging. Uh, this week, we started the fourth book of the Torah, which is the book of Bamidbar, which means in the desert. If the first book of the Torah of Jeff Bereshis is the book of who, who are the players? Who is going to make this world godly? <clears throat> Who's going to bring God down to earth? The first book of the Torah tells us there was Adam and there was Chava and there was Neach and there was Avraham and Sarah. And then there was Yitzchak and Yaakov and then there were the 12 tribes. And you have the people of Israel. That's who. And that's how the book ends. The second book, the book of Shmos, is the book of, of where. Where do we make this dwelling place for God in the lower world? Where does God want to be in the lower world? The second book of Teva tells us God wants to be in the lo lowest part of the lowest world. So how do you make a mishkan? Out of wood and out of wool and out of copper and silver and gold. Material objects. The material stuff that makes up our lives, our food, our dress, our money, our work, our school. That's where God wants to be present. So now we know where. It's not in our heart of hearts. It's not in our faith. It's in our everyday lives. So the key word in the second book of Torah is, and God descended to Mount Sinai. God comes down, and then we make him a dwelling place out of gold, silver, copper, wood, wool, stuff like that. Shmatas. <laughs> The third book of Torah is how? How do you turn something physical spiritual? So we have a whole book of sacrifices. You take a goat or a sheep or some flour and water and you turn it into godliness. You watch it be consumed by holiness. Now we get to the fourth book. So we have the who. We have the where, and we have the how. The fourth book of Torah is when. When the world appears to be a desert, is it becoming more godly? Are we slipping back and becoming less godly? Often it seems that way. In our history, it uh, very often seemed that way. Things just keep getting worse. It's a desert. There is no goodness. There is no godliness. There is no holiness. The world is governed by evil. It certainly seems that way. If you listen to the news. <laughs> but the fourth book of Torah tells us that even when you're in a desert, godliness continues to grow. In fact, the Torah was given in a desert. And so even while it looks like we're not getting anywhere, just beneath the surface, godliness increases and grows constantly. So one of the first things that we're told in this book is that God counts the Jews on every occasion. God tells Moshe, count the Jews. What is this counting obsession? When you have something precious and you know exactly how many of them you have, diamonds, pearls, dollars, you have something you find precious and you know how many there are and yet you keep counting them over and over. 
And if something changes, you immediately want to know how much of a change was there? What's left? What was added? So counting is actually an act of an act of preciousness, an expression of preciousness. God counts the Jewish people because every Jew is precious. That's what we open with. And that is something we need to know when the world looks like a desert. Because does that mean that we failed him? Does that mean he gave up on us? What does it mean? So when the world looks like a desert, the Torah comes and says, God counts you or counts on you, depends on you to get the job done, even in the desert. So uh, Rashi makes an interesting observation. The Torah says that God commanded Moshe to count the people to know exactly how many there are. From what age? From a month old, from 30 days on. A 30 day old child is still nursing. So Moshe said, how am I supposed to count babies? What am I gonna go into people's tents? That's an invasion of privacy. I don't think it would be appreciated. And it's not very modest for Moshe himself to go into every tent where women are nursing their babies. So God said, you go to the tent and at each tent, I will tell you how many people there are in that tent. I mean, just the, the, <laughs> the devotion that God shows to the individual, each tent, each member within the tent. It's very encouraging when we're in a desert. And so we're next, next told that the tribe of Levi have a very special job in the temple. They are recruited, they are drafted to the work in the temple. From what age? One month old. From the time a child born to a Levi is a month old, he is dedicated to the, to the service in the temple. Now, they are not Kohanim. They are not the priests in the temple. They don't do the sacrifices. What they do is be the caretaker of the vessels, of the furniture there, of the, of the moving, when you have to pack up and you have to unpack, that's their job. And to be careful that people don't overreach or enter where they shouldn't. So they are the guardians of the temple. The Rebbe always made a point of reminding us to be a Kohen, you have to be born a Kohen. A Levi, if you're born a Levi, in other words, you're born to the tribe of Levi, Levi, you're drafted for this job. However, anyone whose heart moves him to dedicate himself to the service of the temple voluntarily may do so. So even if you're not born a Levi, where you would be obligated to do the service, you can volunteer to do it out of free will without being commanded. So if you want to dedicate your life to the service of the temple, you can do that. You're allowed to do that. And then you work alongside with the Levi in serving the needs of the temple. Of course, the Rebbe wants everybody to know how every law in Torah is relevant to everyone. So if you're reading about the laws and instructions to the tribe of Levi, how is that relevant to the non-Levi? So the Rebbe always reminded us, 
you can volunteer to be a Levi. And if you do, you're going to have to know the laws. In fact, <clears throat> we're encouraged to volunteer. What does that mean for us today when there is no temple? It means all of God's needs. Everyone can dedicate themselves and devote themselves to protecting God's interest in the world. To make sure that things happen the way they're supposed to happen. And to that purpose, the Rebbe drafted all of us. If you see a Jewish need, if there's a need to teach, if there's a need to inspire, if there's a need to instruct, a need to model what God wants, or a need to let the world know what God wants, we may not be drafted, but we certainly should volunteer. So, of course, there are rabbis, teachers, and all. that's their job. But voluntarily, it's really everybody's opportunity and privilege to do something to turn the world into a temple. And in that way, we are all Levites. We're all Levian. One of the services of the Levites in the temple is that they were a choir, they were singers, and they sang psalms and other songs while the sacrifices were being prepared and the Kohanim were busy with their job. The Levi in groups would stand and sing and keep the mood uplifted and, and holy and so on. So uh, if you're into Jewish music, even if you're not from the tribe of Levi, make the contribution. Keep Jewish singing, Jewish song, Jewish music alive. It's an important part of divine service. That's this week's Parsha. Have a great Shabbos. Thanks for listening. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us. Take a look. Click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best. And join us for some enjoyable conversation.